Dilip, you're here. I can't see anything. I don't know why. There we go. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Joey, do you think I can start? What do you think? Or should I wait? I think so, yes. Okay, okay, great. Um, so um, my name is Sujata Pisaria. I want to welcome everybody um, to this third in our series of uh, webinars on targeting and community networks and anti-poverty programs. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Diego Vera Cosio, in just a moment. But before that, I just want to um, make sure we're all on the same page in terms of where what's happening next. So today is our last seminar for the month of December. Uh, and then we're going to take a break and then come back and have three more seminars uh, beginning on the 12th of January. So we'll have one every Tuesday from the 12th until the 26th of January. So I hope all of you will consider coming to those as well. Um, today we have uh, Diego Vera Cosio, uh, who is um, a PhD from 2018 from the University of California at Berkeley and currently working as, a, as an economist in the research department of the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, he's done uh, a, a few different uh, pieces of research on um, community networks, risk sharing, and microcredit. Um, mainly I think using data from Thailand, the Million Back program. So today he's going to uh, talk to us about, um, as you can see from the title, targeting credit through community members. Uh, Diego, we have an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Yara, and thank you to all the, uh, the organizers for giving me the chance to present my work and just the usual disclaimer applies the opinions and things that I say about this uh, context are my own and not do not represent the opinions or the position of the Inter-American Development Bank and this paper is motivated uh, by the idea that community-based approaches to target government benefits are very popular around the world in particular in developing countries and usually uh, the effectiveness of these programs depends on some sort of tension that is framed uh, on the one hand side by supporters on the idea that community members may have very relevant information and important information that probably uh, government officials that work um, millions of miles uh, away from the local communities may not have, right? Uh, but what the critics would say, the critics would say that this type of uh, approaches to allocate um, government benefits are uh, probably uh, let, uh, you know, prone to, to favoritism under the idea that there is a lot of discretion, there is not a clear rule that would guide the allocation of results. Okay? Something that I, I think uh, makes this tension a little bit uh, more important and a little bit more, you know, uh, tougher is the idea when we have uh, social programs that are trying to target uh, government benefits based on attributes that are costly to verify. Okay, so think of the example, for instance, of a program that is trying to target agricultural input uh, to, to farmers. And you may imagine you, you, you wanna target those with high return, but you know, observing what is high return is actually quite complicated, right? Like think of the counter example would be like a cash transfer program that you're trying to provide uh, uh, resources uh, to the poor. Well community members know that the, the lower income people in their village may have like a smaller house where it may hold less assets and these things are more likely to be verifiable. And what that means is that to the extent that you can verify the attributes uh, the community members may be able to challenge some of the decisions by the local leaders, okay? But now this problem gets even more uh, difficult uh, when on top of having to target resources based on something that is costly to verify, uh, community members may also have to uh, balance a couple of criteria, okay? Um, for instance, things of the context of credit that is going to be what I'm going to be analyzing in this paper, uh, you may think that, for instance, you know, uh, the government may want uh, loans to be allocated 
to the people that actually need it, um, to people that have low levels of consumption, for instance, that will benefit from that. So that's one criteria. But again, you also want people to repay the loan. So there is another criteria that is risk, and risk is not observable. And then you add to that equation the idea that you want to promote businesses, and then this problem gets even more complicated. Okay? And what that means in this context, it would be that, for example, uh, community members may not target resources to the people that are experiencing needs or to the lower income people under the excuse that they might be targeting it to the most productive and so on. But at the same time, because this is going to be a more prone to discretion, at the same time, information is crucial, right? Because these things are highly uh, to, be, to be observed. Now, something that I found in the literature that is less explored is the idea that although these programs are very common, uh, there is less evidence regarding uh, the role of markets, in particular secondary markets, in allocating uh, this type of uh, resources, and in particular in attenuating potential targeting frictions that can arise in this setting. Okay, so the example is that, for instance, somebody receives some subsidy from the government and they don't really need it. Well, if there's a secondary market that they're probably transacted with somebody that actually needs it, and therefore the resources may lead, may end up arriving to the people that actually. Needed. Okay, to which extent this is actually a mechanism, I have seen less evidence on that, and I think this is going to be the focus of, of this paper and of this presentation. So I'm going to study this in the context of the million, village, a million bad village fund program. This is one of the largest microfinance interventions ever implemented, and what is key about this program and makes it unique is that local committees were in charge of allocating loans from a government donated credit fund. Okay. So the idea is that the government is going to donate uh, around uh, 1 million baht, hence the name of the, of the program, to each uh, village. A village is going to elect a uh, committee, and this committee made up of community members is going to be allocating the loans and deciding the interest rate and the terms. Okay. So I'm going to be interested in answering uh, three important questions. So the first one is basically trying to understand uh, what predicts selection into program, what predicts program borrowing. Okay, so is it the case that community members are allocating credit to those uh, uh, households that are of low risk and are likely to pay? Is it the case that they are allocating credit to the poorest households that might be more credit constrained, for instance? Or is it the case that uh, community members are allocating these loans to the highly productive households, those that are better able to turn credit into profit? Okay, and the answer that I'm gonna find is to some extent that no, this is not the case. So the question is, where is the money going? Who is getting the money? And something that is quite common in the context of uh, community-based approaches to allocating resources is the idea uh, that connections are political connections to the local elite matter. And that is exactly something that I observe in the data. Okay, the second question, sure. So just trying to understand why people, why connections might matter. So I guess it, it hinges a lot on what what the incentives are for the local committees, right? So in terms of continuation of this program, do political connect uh, continue the program in future years to continue to get access to the fund? Uh, you, um, sorry, I, I lost you for, for a couple of seconds while you were asking the question. So political no, no, connections? I, yeah, so would uh, political connections be important in having continued access to the million baht program in the few after in future years? So that is something that I'm going to uh, try to show some evidence later in, in the talk. Uh, but, but the idea is that I don't know if I get you get your question correctly, but you are asking whether giving money to people with connections is something that is going to guarantee the existence of the programs in the future. OK? Uh, uh, the short answer is that I don't think that is the case in this program, but we will see in a couple uh, slides. Uh, so yeah, so the first question that we're trying to answer is uh, who, who borrows. The second question is uh, to which extent local credit markets can offset potential targeting distortions that may arise in this setting. Okay, And the idea is they may do it, uh, but only partially. Okay, So we're going to find some evidence that although certain group of community members, those with connections, are more likely to borrow from the program directly, those without connections are going to end up uh, receiving some of these resources through informal credit markets, in particular, through, through relatives. 
And at the end of the talk, I'll be interested in understanding uh, a couple of counter, uh, results from counterfactual exercises in which uh, one has first quantified the extent to which eliminating this connection-based advantage uh, would uh, lead to welfare gains and gains in aggregate output. But also it would be interesting to, it would be interesting to try to understand to which extent this allocation achieved by community members that is subject to potential targeting frictions due to connections uh, performs better or worse than other alternative ways of allocating credit that are common, such as credit scoring model, for instance. Okay, uh, so how we're gonna try to achieve this, uh, what I'm gonna do first is rely on data from the thousand time monthly survey. Uh, this is a high frequency panel following households for over 14 or 15 years on a monthly basis. And I'm gonna use this data to sort of try to characterize households in different dimensions. I'm gonna be exploring the, uh, different type of characteristics uh, that are going to be, be measured before the program was implemented. Okay, so I'm gonna be trying to understand whether resources are going uh, to households with low per capita consumption, households that experience more volatility in their consumption patterns, households that have experienced shocks, households that experience higher TFP, uh, that are more productive, higher households that are riskier and have a back credit history, and households that have connections with the local political elite, in this case, uh, the village council. Okay, then I'm going to be exploiting uh, within borrower and cross lender variation uh, regarding the internal rate of returns to these loans for the lender. And the idea is that I'm gonna try to use this uh, data in order to try to understand whether the connection based advantage that you're going to find in this paper is related to favoritism or not. Then I'm gonna be exploiting the quasi-experimental variation in the role of the program. In this high frequency data set, uh, the program was first delivered in some village earlier in 2001 and later in, 2000, uh, in 2002. I'm gonna experience this differential rollout uh, in order to try to quantify effects of the rollout of the program on informal markets. And the idea is that I'm gonna be trying to distinguish between the effects for connected and unconnected households and trying to see whether unconnected households get access to credit through this informal channel. And towards the end of the talk, I'm gonna be discussing two, uh, two counterfactuals. The first one is a counterfactual that would eliminate the connection-based advantage and will redistribute uh, this amount of credit uh, to people that didn't have access to the program. And a second counterfactual allocation in which I'm gonna simulate an allocation based on a credit scoring model. I'm gonna redistribute uh, credit from people that wouldn't have been eligible by a scoring model, but obtain credit from the program to people that would have been eligible by the scoring model, but ended up not borrowing from this program. Okay, um, just uh, to give you like a snapshot of what I find, I find that credit was not uh, allocated based on poverty, productivity, or repayment. Uh, I find that instead credit was disproportionately allocated to households with connections with local leaders. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, in, in detail, I think, uh, what is the role that connections play, uh, but long story short, I'm going to provide some evidence of favoritism. However, despite this credit, um, uh, this, this targeting frictions, I'm, I'm going to find that credit was indirectly delivered to unconnected households to informal credit markets, okay? And towards... Uh, you are mute. Sorry, Philip uh, has a question. Oh, okay. Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, so my question is: Are you going to show any uh, outcomes on either repayment of loans, on output, or the incomes of borrowers? Um, yes. 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 Uh, you will see that first. Uh, I'm going to characterize these households in different dimensions. In the second part of the paper, we're going to be looking at outcomes of the loans because I think that is going to be central to understanding whether these uh, patterns that we find uh, are related to favoritism, for instance, or better enforcement. Uh, we're going to be looking at that, and then we're going to be looking at other outcomes in informal credit market. Okay. Um, one final note uh, regarding all the exercises that uh, I will do. Uh, so if we take a look of the first results, suggesting that there are frictions uh, related to connections, okay? Uh, this sort of, sort of sounds a little bit negative towards the program, but despite these frictions, what I'm going to find is that this decentralized approach 
to targeting credit could be even more appealing than a centralized approach based on hard information uh, to the extent that the centralized approach based on hard information may end up delivering credit uh, to people that are actually even richer and not necessarily more productive. Okay, so this is hopefully gonna get clearer towards the end of the talk, but let me, let me start a little bit by telling you uh, some details about the context. I, I think yeah, go we have another question. Yes, Erica, go ahead. Yes, sorry, sorry for the baby run, but um, I have a question for Diego. So we know that, uh, you know, from the literature that who provides this, the delivery of these services matters, and you mentioned there is a committee. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to know here if you're going to say something about, who, you know, because you talk about the elite, but you didn't quite talk about the composition of this committee. If you're going to say something about the composition of the committee and how this will matter for the program. Uh, that is coming in a couple of, couple of slides. Um, there are going to be central caveats. I, I, can, I can tell you more about the composition of the committee, but uh, I'm not going to be able to measure a lot about the, to get a lot of measures about the composition of the, of mm -hmm. the committee. Uh, but that is coming in, I think, two slides. And if I don't mention it, please feel free to interrupt me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about the context. Uh, I'm going to be studying the context of the Million Bad Village Fund program. Uh, why is this program important? I think this was one of the most emblematic programs of its kind. It was one of the largest microfinance interve uh, interventions uh, ever implemented. It was large scale. Uh, basically, I think 98% of the villages in Thailand had access to these village funds. It was uh, a, a, big, a big deal back then, but Something that is quite important from this program, again, is, is, is its governance. Okay? It's the fact that it is community members, the ones that are making the loan decision. Okay? Now, this doesn't come without controversy. So something that I saw from the Bank of Post uh, is this article, right? That there's a lot of stories related to potential uh, scope for corruption in this type of program. So there might be like some uh, scope for, for resource capture. And this is something that we are gonna try to analyze in this paper. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit uh, first about the program and then about uh, how, uh, how, how it is managed by the local com committees, okay? So the main objective of this program was to increase access to credit, promote income generation, and provide relief to households in need, okay? Uh, the idea was that the government donated credit funds to rural villages, around 1 million uh, baht per village, hence the name of the program, and this was in, uh, <clears throat> implemented during 2001 and 2002. Several of these village funds are still, uh, still operate uh, as of now, but by, by the way. Um, so some restrictions on regulations regarding the loans, what type of loans are going to be given from this program? On average, there are going to be loans that are gonna be given at a uh, low interest rate, low interest rate relative to the other lenders uh, in the village. Okay, so on average, uh, the interest rate uh, per year associated to program loans is going to be 70% which is going to be as small to the second lowest rate uh, measured in, in the data set that is going to be associated to loans given by the state-owned bank, the Bank for Agriculture and Agricultural Cooperative, BAAC. These loans are going to be individual liability loans and there's not going to be, uh, a cosigner is not going to be needed and there is no need for a collateral as well. These loans are going to be uh, short-term loans. They, they were supposed to be repaid within less than, than 12 months. And there are also going to be some restrictions on the total amount that you can borrow at once. Okay, so the loans, the maximum amount of loans is supposed to be 20,000 baht, which is around $450 back, back then. So that is the maximum. Now, the government provided some incentive for well-performing villages, and in particular for villages that did well and in which these village funds prospered, the government uh, would uh, increase the amount of funds later on. Okay, so the idea of the government was to give this seed capital to the village, they can establish these credit funds and then can make these funds grow over time and become self-sustainable, okay? The stick or the flip side of this is that the government also threatened uh, the villagers and the villages uh, with the suspension of other transfer from the government if these village funds were not properly managed, okay? Now, let me tell you a little bit about the governance of the program and how uh, the committee that was in charge of uh, managing these loans uh, was, uh, was organized, okay? And Erika, please, if you, if, you, if you have questions or I don't respond what you, what you were asking, please let me know. So the program was managed by the Village Fund Committee. 
uh, which we're going to call the VFC. Uh, this committee decides who will face first. Oh, I think we have a question. Sure. Pushka? Um, yes. So, sorry, the previous slide, you said the bank loans were 9%. So that, you know, seems fairly low relative to the bank loans in the rest of the, rest of, around the rest of the world, right? Is it any particular kind bank loan on a particular program it is a part that you're talking about? It is a particular bank. So uh, these bank loans were mostly coming from the Bank for Agriculture and Agricultural Cooperatives, the AAC which is run by the government. So probably these loans are also, also subsidized, right? But these loans are supposed to be for agricultural businesses in, in, the, in the village. So they, they serve a different type of population, but they are present in the village. And yes, they are, they are not loans from like the standard commercial bank or like from a big corporation. Is that what we have in mind? Suppose we have all, I guess there are also these uh, informal loans. What kind of interest rate would there be for informal loans. In no, this way country. higher. Way, way higher. higher, right? Yeah. Way higher, way higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think the average for, for loans from relatives would be around 14%, and for loans from non relatives would be, you know, close to 20, 20% 20 a year. So the, the, the interest yeah. rates, at least self reported information, is, is way higher. So if you think of a gradient, uh, the gradient looks the way the way you will right. imagine. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let me get back to the... Uh, Sorry, we have uh, another question from Dilip. Yeah, sure, two, sure. two more questions. One is the uh, regulation does not include any, any uh, rules about who should or should not be getting the loans. And uh, second, is there anything about access to loans in a future year? Is it linked? I mean, is there any sort of incentive for people to repay loans in terms of you know, future credit access is based on repayment of earlier loans? Is there any, any connection between loans in different years? So to the extent that I reviewed the, the, the laws <laughs> and, the, and the, um, the laws related to the, to the, to the village run program, I would say not explicitly, but certainly there, is, there, there should be the incentive to, to repay, right? The, you may imagine that people and may get along from here, but you know there might be some ways in which community members may enforce repayment. And to some extent, the, what the government wanted is this this village funds to to prosper over time. And repayment was central was central for this. Right? The only way to make a village fund grow over time is by enforcing repayment. Otherwise, you know the the, the fund would would decline. Uh, when it comes to whether there was like a regulation of who who should be getting loan or not. Uh, there wasn't. Uh, there are more rules uh, related to who can, who can be elected to be a part of the village fund committee or not. Uh, but long story short, these village fund committees are going to meet. They're going to set their own rules based on the community traditions and um, <clears throat> the community norms. And then they're going to abide to those rules, except that we will have some regulations in the size of the law and so on that I showed you in the previous slide. So let, let me tell you a little bit about the, this village fund committee, okay? So it's going to be uh, made up of uh, nine to 15 community members. It's going to be 50%, at least on paper, 50% males, 50% uh, females. Uh, it's, uh, these guys are going to be, uh, um, you know, employees of this village fund committee and they're going to receive a nominal remuneration. Uh, the village fund uh, committee is gonna meet uh, occasionally, sometimes like twice a year in order to uh, make decisions regarding the program. And there, this the village fund committee members uh, are going to be elected and they are going to serve for two years. Uh, and then they can be reelected, so reelection is possible. So then is the question of who uh, can be part of this village fund, okay? So basically there are some like broad gu guidelines uh, and, and that <clears throat> regulate who can be part of this village fund. Uh, the first one is that it has to be people of legal age or, or females uh, that are younger but that are married. So that was the first rule. The second is that uh, you, you cannot have a criminal background. Uh, you cannot have some uh, like mental disorder either. And you have to be considered capable and respected by the community. Okay. So if you satisfy this, these categories, you, you might be eligible uh, for, for being elected as a member of the village fund committee. Okay. Uh, if you don't, then 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 
then you wouldn't be able to even 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 to run. Sorry, so, sorry. Who, who, deci who decides on this last criteria of whether you're respected in the village? Who who decides uh, that? Yeah, that's something that people in the village. So so the way this works uh, is that. Uh, the ongoing village fan committee will hold a meeting in which all the members of the village would participate, and therefore they will stipulate the roles. And among those roles, basically respecting the culture and respecting the uh, costumes in the in the village, these things are going to be are going to be uh, uh, decided. Okay, but to some extent, if, if we're, we are trying to get at this, whether this is a little bit subjective or can be influenced by elites, for sure, for sure, there are no written rules about this. Okay, uh, then this village fund committee is going to be on paper again, independent of the local government, it's going to be independent of the village head and the village council, okay? And it's going to report to the program central office in Bangor. Okay, now I say this in paper because you may imagine that the local elites may exert some, some, some sort of, um, of pressure on the decisions, but that's coming in the next slide. So, just I want to be fully upfront and to prevent confusions later on, I am not able to measure or identify people in the data set that are members of the village fund committees. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to identify those households. I am going to be able to identify households that are members to the local government, that is the village chief or the council members. Okay, these are two separate entities. Unfortunately, I'm not, I cannot identify the ones that are part of the village fund committee but I'm gonna be able to tell you quite a bit about the people that are part of the local political elite, the village council and uh, <laughs> the village council and the village chief, okay? The first question I think uh, is important to try to understand in this context is to which extent this uh, village chief uh, and this village uh, council can influence uh, the allocation of credit, okay? So first take a look at what uh, the village council does. So it's the local government, is made up of the village chief and the advisors. It's the smallest political unit in Thailand in these villages. And they are going to be elected officials and they usually serve until retirement age, okay? Um, now, these guys are going to be powerful and to some extent they're going to be able to uh, influence uh, the village fund, okay? Um, I wanna highlight a couple of mechanisms. I'm sure there are other ways in which they can uh, uh, get a hold on the, on the village fund committee. But the first idea is that as, as being the local the political elite and the local government, they are in charge of uh, conflict resolution. So these guys are powerful and you wanna please them, okay? The second thing uh, is that uh, they are quite popular. They, at the end of the day, they are the elite. Uh, their families are, are, are powerful inside the village and it is possible that their families are well respected and therefore can run for office and can run for this uh, village fund committee. Okay, there is nothing forbidden that they do and it's actually quite likely that they end up uh, doing that. So those are like the main things that I think uh, may, may lead to potential uh, elite capture. And the idea what I, have, what I want you to have in mind is that we're trying to understand how these guys uh, can influence uh, the potential uh, allocation of credit in this problem, okay? So that is exactly what we're gonna to try to show you evidence on in the next slides. Yes. Can I ask a question? So, you know, they serve until, they serve until, um, retirement age. That means basically they are once they're elected, they're elected for life. Is you know said so there's no re-election or anything. Yeah, so, there was not. There was not. How, how yeah. does... I'm sorry, you froze. Yeah. Sorry. Go go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um... Let me tell you a little bit about the context and the data. Okay. So I'm gonna be using great data from the Thousand Type project. This is a fantastic effort uh, by Rob Thousand uh, who followed uh, around 700 households in 16 villages for 15 years on a monthly basis. And he collected basically everything he could except for information from the village fund committee. So that's the one thing that was missing from, from, from the data, but uh, it's fantastic information. And why is the data set important? So first, uh, the people living in these villages, the households are mostly entrepreneurs. Like all of them have some sort of business, right? They either uh, pro uh, provide uh, labor to other households, but they also have their crops, they, they produce rice. Uh, they have non-agricultural businesses, particularly retail. They're into shrimping uh, and fishing as well. So they have different sources of income, 
Okay, and we can think of this as like an economic unit, an economic production unit. Um, the second key fact from this um, data set is that it's a long panel and therefore it allows me to characterize the households using pre-programmed data. Okay, and for this, I'm going to be exporting monthly data on two to three years uh, uh, before, before the program, but it also has fantastic information on the uh, household financial accounts, which is going to be useful to uh, get a measure of the components of their balance sheets and income statements and to measure some outcomes. In particular, I'm going to be interested in trying to measure revenues and uses of inputs uh, because I'm going to try to estimate some production function using this data. Uh, it's also great because it records transactions across households in the same village. So basically they ask uh, each household member like to whom they sold, uh, for instance, agricultural input, from whom they buy uh, uh, fertilizers, who did you hire, for whom did they work. And with this data, you can construct an illicit economic network at the village level. And then what I'm going to do is use these networks and see who is connected to the local political elite, okay? And on top of that, it also has a uh, data self-reported regarding repayment and, and loan, loan outcomes. Well, let me start uh, a little bit with the first uh, set of results. Uh, there's nothing causal here, but we're going to see some descriptive statistics that I think are going to be uh, quite insightful, okay? So first, I would like to analyze uh, who is obtaining credit from this program, okay? And for this, just try to recap and recall what were the stated objectives of the program it was to prom promote income generation, which you may think that uh, may mean that village fund committees may wanna target those households that are better able to turn uh, credit into revenues, for instance, mainly those with higher productivity. Uh, it is also uh, one of the objectives is to provide relief to needy households. So you may imagine that village fund committees may also be willing to target households uh, that are poor. Okay. But at the same time, the problem is complicated because the village fund committee also has to guarantee uh, and make sure that these uh, funds are sustainable over time. So they may consider issues of credit history at the same time as well. Okay. So these are the three relevant uh, measures that I'm going to be uh, looking at. And, and I'm just going to show you some, some, some figures regarding that, but there's uh, certainly a deeper discussion of this. In the paper, and the first question is whether the money is going to uh, poorest household. Okay, and what you can see here is a plot of the pre programmed uh, average uh, lock per capita consumption, and I distinguish uh, program borrowers from non borrowers. And you can see that at each point in the distribution, uh, program borrowers are going to exceed higher levels of per capita consumption than non borrowers. Okay, this is almost as is the and they were first order stochastically dominating uh, the distribution of non borrowers. Okay, suggesting that the, the, the resources were not allocated to the poorest households. Instead, they were allocated to households that were a little bit better, better off. The second question is that uh, maybe, um, you know, these loans weren't allocated to the poorest households because they were allocated to most productive households. Okay, so if that was true, then we should observe like. Uh, a similar pattern, but with, with productivity. You should observe that the most productive houses are to the right. And um, to do that, I relied on baseline uh, data on revenues and, and, and labor and usage of input and the stock of assets available for production. I use this data to estimate production functions and I'm not gonna go into the details of that right now. Um, but then with those elasticities from these production functions, I back out measures of PFP uh, at baseline. Okay. And something that I observed is that when I plot the distributions, they don't look that much different. Okay? So at least we can say that in terms of, of productivity, it is not the case that the loans were also targeted at the most productive. Okay? Is this just measurement error? I'm going to argue that not, uh, because these measures of productivity are going to be correlated with productivity shifters that you may imagine, are going to be correlated positively with education, uh, for, negatively with the experience of uh, shocks affecting their businesses. So they do measure something, it's just that this, uh, the community members are not allocating credit based on productivity, okay? So if it's not going to the poor and it's not going to the most productive, where is the money going, okay? And the usual suspect is going to be political connections with this local elite. And this is exactly uh, what I find when I look at the data. So, so in this figure, I, I plot um, the average uh, program credit, uh, and I plotted for three groups, okay? So 
here at the top are those households that are members of the village council, okay? So a household that is part of the village council or at the household of the village, village chief. In blue, a plot uh, <clears throat> lending, uh, bor total borrowing for households that have a connection through these networks to these guys, okay? To the guys that are part of the local political elite. Okay, and in black, a plot and connected households that are neither part of the elite nor have a connection with the local political elite. And you can see a clear gradient, okay? Um, of course, I mean, what this means is just that there are some targeting frictions and that connections may play uh, a role in that. Uh, there might be other attributes that can explain this relationship. So what I do in this table is basically uh, in this diagonal, I plot, um, I report just the raw correlations controlling for village fixed effects. And then in these other two columns, I just add a bunch of controls related to demographic characteristics, exposure to shocks, um, and so on. I control for previous access to institutional credit, uh, for whether a household reported ah, having missed a payment before. But you can see that a village, a commun a village fund uh, committees are not necessarily punishing uh, those with bad credit history. Uh, they are also giving more money to the people uh, that already had access to institutional credit. And the key patterns, namely that they uh, provide more credit to wealthier households and to better connected households still hold, okay? And something that I wanna um, talk later is to try to understand what this correlation, with what this coefficient means, okay? And one idea is that connections uh, may not necessarily mean edit capture, okay? Because it could be the case uh, that this is not about connections with the elite. This is just about network position, where you are located in the network. How many people do you know in the village? And why is this an important distinction? It is an important distinction because if you are more central in the network, it might be the case that you are better able to transmit information. And we know that these community-based approaches to allocating resources should operate through the networks, okay? So something that I do that I, it's quite interesting is just uh, plotting the raw correlation that was in the previous table, okay? And then adding controls. And you see that the coefficient shrinks, uh, but not dramatically. And what I do in column three is not include the demographic controls and only include degree centrality, okay? The number of links that each, uh, each household has in the village. And when you include that, basically this coefficient uh, is, uh, is shrunk substantially. Okay, now this suggests that probably network position is, is very important factor for this and that there might be like some targeting frictions that arise from the fact that people are not equally connected to everybody, okay? However, when we look at uh, what happens to households that are members of the lead, you know, and we distinguish elite connections between those that are part of the lead themselves and those that are connected uh, in the networks, we see that even after controlling for the total amount of links for the position on the network, we observe that this coefficient is substantially higher, okay? Suggesting that at least it is the case that local political elites, even after controlling for productivity, poverty, credit history, demographic, and so on, uh, they are more likely to borrow more from the program, okay? And one of the questions then is why, what, this is, what, what does it mean? And I'm gonna sort of try to uh, distinguish between two types of, of mechanisms that may, may, may be behind this relationship, okay? The first idea is that uh, one model that will predict this, this type of outcome is a model in which there is favoritism, okay? The village fund committee probably likes better the leads because they may probably receive some favor later on, okay? So that will rationalize the results that we found. Another model is that the village fund committee uh, may want to increase enforcement and maybe, you know, uh, enforcement repayment is, is going to be easier if you give money to people that have relevant connections because you can actually uh, um, you know, rely on these connections to monitor, okay? So that will also rationalize the previous result. The key difference between these models is that one is efficient in the sense that would maximize repayment and maximize the returns to the lender. The other one is very costly and should lead to lower returns to the lender, okay? So we're gonna try to bring this idea to the data uh, by basically looking at ex post returns of these loans measure as the internal rate of return uh, of each loan. And we're gonna be comparing loans uh, that are taken from the million bad village fund program on one hand 
and relative to loans that are taken from other local community-based institutions, such as cooperative production credit groups, rice banks, and so on. What is similar about these two things, uh, these two lenders, is that they both rely on local information and connections. What is different is that the Millage Fund, Million Bad Village Fund program was financed by the government, whereas these other local organizations are self-funded by the member. Okay, so the incentive might be different. Now, what is the empirical exercise that we're gonna try to do in a nutshell? Uh, imagine the case, for instance, of, of Sujata. Imagine that you live in one of these villages and imagine that you don't have connections, okay? So you may borrow from either the Bill Bad program and another uh, community-based organization, but they probably will treat you the same because you don't have connections. Now, imagine my case, I have connections, I'm like a relative of the, of the village chief. Uh, maybe, you know, that, those connections wouldn't buy me that much from the local organizations uh, that are self-funded because they are actually taking care of their own money, but that may buy me some leverage from this uh, government-funded uh, million bad village fund. Okay, so that is that is the idea. And um, what would happen in that case is that it is going to be the case that uh, there is favoritism if we observe that loans are given first to the most connected houses, that, which is what we do, but also that these loans are going to be less profitable for the lender. Okay, so that is the spirit of this uh, uh, exercise. And I'm going to be regressing the returns to the lender um, on borrower fixed effects, lender fixed effects and an interaction of whether the borrower had connections with the local political elite and whether the loan uh, was taken from the medium bad village fund program, okay? And the key parameter of interest is going to be beta. And when beta is negative, this is going to be suggestive of favoritism. When beta is positive, this would be suggestive of better enforcement. So I'm a little bit confused here mm -hmm. about I mean, the criterion you said was one of enforcement, which pertains to repayment of loans. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're looking here at the return to the borrower, I presume. The return is to the whom? Lender. The return is to the borrower. To the lender. Right. So right. those are two different criteria. Uh, uh, actually, no. I mean, the, the returns to the lender, right? So how am I going to measure this? By the internal rate of return. How is that measured? We're going to be looking at the entire stream of payments by the borrower for each loan and we're gonna compute the internal rate of return. So that includes uh, the initial loan terms, the initial characteristics, but also repayment behavior, right? So probably if a loan is not paid in time, then that loan is gonna have a lower return. If a loan is paid in time, probably that loan is gonna have a higher return. So just to clarify, uh, I'm talking about returns to the lender in this To case. the lender, okay. To the lender, yeah. And I'm uh, sorry, what is a comparison loan? A comparison loan would be a loan from a cooperative, uh, from a production credit group, from, from a rice group. These are all local, locally provided loans. These are local or organizations, okay? So they rely on local information, but the difference with the mid and bad village fund program is that you know, these are funded by the contributions of the members of the groups as opposed to the program that is funded from the government. Okay, so that, that is sort of like the empirical exercise. Those are the comparison groups. Um, so, sorry, so, just to understand about these self-funded programs, are they mainly being funded by the richer, richer households in the village? That is a good question. That is a good question. Um, I, I haven't looked at the descriptive statistic of who's a member of these organizations, and probably that's something, like that, that's something I should have. Uh, I imagine that there might be like heterogeneity in the sense that some organizations might be funded by wealthier households. Uh, but others might be trying to provide support. And uh, that, that's something that I, I don't have an answer for it. Uh, but what is important in terms of this comparison is that if there is selection, uh, we're gonna be controlling for borrower fixed effects. Okay, so we're gonna be making comparisons for the same borrower when that borrower borrows from different uh, from different sources of credit. So, so yeah, so, that's certainly an, an issue. Take care of it. So the fact that you will find that beta is negative Mm -hmm. could, could just mean that they don't bother to enforce the million baht loans, right? Mm -hmm. it, could be, it, it, it could be that case. What I'm gonna find in the data though is that the main difference is not coming from, from lack of enforcement. Uh, it's coming from, from giving them way cheaper loans. Um, that's, that's something that can actually lead, lead to uh, lower returns. That, that is evidence that is quite consistent with other papers in credit markets that look at favoritism, not at the village level, 
more at a corporate level, but that's that surprisingly was something that uh, was was quite consistent with with the evidence. But let me tell you a little bit about what I find. So, so you have to borrow from both places to be in the to be identified. I mean, to yeah. contribute yes. to the identification in the regression. So, yes. is that most people, or is that a pretty small subset of people? Who borrow from like, both the program and some other? It's like fifty percent. It was three hundred and thirty-three households uh, in the village out of uh, in in the sample out of seven hundred. Yeah. So of course, I mean, the caveat here is that this is you know this tell us something for those type of people that borrow from multiple loans. It doesn't tell us something about the entire pool of potential borrowers for the village. So that that's 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 something that you know uh, that's. We, we should take into consideration when considering when analyzing analyzing the results. Okay, so uh, just to try to speed up here, um, uh, what I find is that precisely when the loan is given to connected houses and when the loan comes from the million bad village for program, these loans tend to be uh, of of lower return for the lender. Okay, suggesting that this idea of enforcement probably wasn't uh, wasn't the main. Uh, course, uh, explaining why more money was given to better connected households. It's consistent with the idea of favoritism, okay? But then you may say, for instance, well, what if the village fund committee uh, was financing these loans because uh, the village uh, head may have projects that uh, may include the entire community and would stimulate the economy, would pro produce more, more, more jobs, for instance. That could be the case, socially motivated loans, why not? Uh, so if that was the case, we shouldn't observe that pattern when we look at consumption loans. And it's precisely in consumption loans where we see most of the variation coming from. Okay? So these are consumption loans. These are loans that are for private uh, uh, consumption goods, such as TVs, like home assets uh, or home improvements. Okay? And we observe the same pattern in, in this type of loan, suggesting that this was not necessarily motivated by the idea that they were giving uh, better terms and better loans to the more connected because they have uh, you know, uh, projects with better with positive externalities. We are observing that when we look at consumption loans. But there is more, right? Like we can come up with other stories. Like the other story, and I think that is uh, quite sensible, is the idea that maybe this is the price that the program has to take in order to implement and to guarantee sustainability of these of these loans. Okay. So if that was the case, what we should observe is that the more money you give to the elites, the more these village funds grow over time. Okay, and this is only correlation. There is no actual, uh, you know, empirical strategy to this, but I think it was quite important to to take a look at this uh, at this possibility. So what we look in this figure is uh, in the horizontal axis the ratio between uh, the total million baht portfolio in a given year relative to the total million baht portfolio in the first year of implementation. Okay, and on this side, uh, on on this horizontal axis, I plot the share of million baht village fund loans that were given to the village council members, okay, or the village group during the first year. And what you can see here is that those village funds that prospered over time were the ones that give that gave very few money uh, to the local elite earlier on. And those that didn't prosper over time, those that contracted were the ones that gave more money to the local political elite, suggesting again that this might not be the case that you know we are trying to build communities and trying to guarantee uh, the, the subsistence of these funds that doesn't seem to be consistent with this piece of evidence. Although again, this is not causal, right? Does this include also the injection of new funds that you talked about as the carrot strategy? Yes, yes. It yes, does. Yes. And, yes. and what if you look at the total amount of funding that comes into this village? Because you said there are other programs also that could be discontinued mm -hmm. if you didn't do well? Mm -hmm. That 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 is a, actually a very good suggestion. I, I didn't I didn't think of that. Like maybe looking at whether there is like a government transfer program that is consistent with this with this pattern. That 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 should be should be interesting. Yeah. So especially if those other programs were directly targeting mm -hmm. the poor, for example, using much more objective criteria where it was harder to fudge, for example, then you can mm -hmm. imagine a situation where the village the local village poor are willing to have this program go to the elite if it helps to ensure that the other one is going to survive. Okay, no, yeah, that, that is possible. 
To some extent, that also is evidence, that would be evidence of rent seeking behavior though, right? Because it would be the case that the elites are taking advantage of the program in order to get their, 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 their slice, right? Uh, <clears throat> from, from poor people, but yeah, I, I think that's something interesting that probably can, can, can be taken a look at. Uh, so, um, so yeah, question um, here. I, I'm just trying to get a sense of what fraction of the village fund is going to the village council, because I guess one distortion is between village council members and the rest of the village, but the other is amongst people who are not council members between mm -hmm. people that vary in their connections, mm -hmm. to the village council. So this, these distortions, I mean, the regression that you showed earlier, mm -hmm. where if you ignore the village council members themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then the connections variable was highly correlated. I, I forget where, with, uh, sorry, the, could you just go back to that regression? The previous one, yeah. Yeah. Right, so when you include yes. the degree, yeah, it, it, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the connectedness with the village council disappeared. Yes, yes. So I guess, uh, so there could be this information story for the non-village council members. Yeah, it is possible. Uh, right. Yeah. And the yeah. other is, this is, I mean, it, 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 I mean, I would have expected you to show results broken down by the interest rate on the loans and the rate of default on the loans, just mm -hmm. as a way of breaking down the internal rate of return, just to get a better understanding of, you know, what the distortions were. So uh, do you know offhand what, I mean, I guess, I mean, the enforcement story could be that more connected people, it is easier to enforce as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that is why, you know, they get the loans. Mm -hmm. So even though they may get lower interest rate loans, they may repay the loans more frequently. So the overall return, you know, may not mm -hmm. be lower if you lend to the better connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that, that, that is possible. I. I think that uh, in this table, we, I, I actually uh, report the, the differences in terms of uh, loan, loan outcomes, but also loan conditions, okay? So there doesn't seem to be anything uh, going on when it comes to uh, repayment or requesting an extension. Most of the action seems to be coming from the fact that they are going to obtain uh, loans at lower interest rates and larger loans, okay? Uh, this, this is also true when we break down by type of connections, elite members themselves, or those directly connected to the households. And these uh, effects are, are even stronger when we look only at consumption loans. Uh, in particular, I think it didn't make it to the slides, but when we look at consumption loans, uh, the probability that you obtain a loan that is larger than the, than the allowed amount is, is positive if you have connections that you borrow from, from, the, from the village fund. Um, yes, yeah, so let me uh, go to the third part of the paper. And this third part of the paper is motivated by, by the idea that either through favoritism or through uh, information transmission costs, uh, there seem to be a connection based distortions okay, that may affect the way resources are, are targeted. Um, now, the question is if there are actually distortions, it, it may be the case that uh, probably other lenders in the village may be willing uh, to capitalize on this and provide some loans to, to the households that didn't end up obtaining loans. Okay? And this is what I'm gonna try to exploit in the next slides. Why do I think this is something reasonable? Uh, I think this is something reasonable because as we see that the program is rolled out, okay, I also observe that there's an increase in lending to other households. Okay? So what I plot in this uh, figure is uh, total lending to other households aggregated at the village level and uh, before and after the introduction of the program. And there is an increase, of course, the estimates are noisy, but you can see that there is an increase in lending, suggesting that if anything, the program stimulated uh, lending in informal markets. Now, the big question in this case is to which extent the market forces can undo uh, what the targeted frictions do, okay? So that is the idea behind the third empirical analysis on the paper. So remember, unconnected households obtain less program credit due to targeted frictions. Uh, so if that was the case, other well-informed lenders should be willing to serve to, uh, to give loans to unconnected households. Okay? I'm going to try to test for this. 
Uh, so going to be exploring quasi-experimental variation in the rollout of the program. It was introduced in different times uh, in different villages. Uh, and I'm going to be looking at loans taken from relatives. Okay, why from relatives? Because this is the main source of informal loans in, in, in the village. And it's precisely where we think like other ways in, uh, of uh, inducing enforcement may, may take place. Okay. And then we're gonna regress uh, total borrowing from relatives on household fixed effects, time fixed effects, and uh, dummy variable that takes the value of one after the program was introduced in the village and zero otherwise. Uh, and I'm gonna estimate these regressions for unconnected households and connected households separately. Okay, so what happens in the formal market in the case of unconnected households? Uh, what you can see in this figure is that as the program is rolled out, uh, there is an increase in borrowing from relatives, okay, in the case of unconnected houses. Now, what we're going to see in the, <clears throat> when we analyze uh, what happens for connected houses, we're going to find evidence of an increase, but the magnitudes are going to be smaller, okay. So what we see in this table is that as the program is rolled out, it is unconnected houses, the ones that are going to be borrowing more uh, from, from relatives in the same villages, okay. When we look at the uh, probability of borrowing from relatives, we're gonna find that it is the case that unconnected households are more likely to borrow from relatives as the program is introduced in these villages and not the case uh, in the case of, uh, of connected households, okay? Now, what does this suggest? It suggests that while connected households uh, had more access to program credit, unconnected households on the other hand are gonna be benefiting indirectly uh, through informal credit markets, okay? Suggesting that to some extent uh, market forces or secondary arrangements uh, are actually attenuating potentially uh, potential target, targeting distortion. Now, I'm gonna give two caveats here. Uh, the first one is that this magnitude is not going to be enough to close the gap between uh, program borrowing between connected and unconnected houses, okay? So markets are going to be reallocating resources to unconnected houses but they are not going to be able to fully offset uh, the results from the initial connection-based distortion. So that is something I wanna emphasize. The second thing that I wanna emphasize that yes, unconnected houses are gonna borrow more, but they are, borrow, they are going to borrow more at uh, higher interest rates. Okay, so when I look at the data of all the loans that were taken uh, within a year of the introduction of the village fund, and when I look at these loans uh, related to uh, taking from relatives, the interest rate is going to be 12% a year, which is substantially higher than the 7% associated to program loan, suggested that there was some, some, some arbitrage in, in this case, okay? So in the pit, yes. I'm, I'm a little confused because mm -hmm. I think the story you're telling is that it's these connected households that get the, the million baht loans mm -hmm. that are then lending on to unconnected households, right? Yeah. But yeah. But but these are loans from relatives. So then aren't the unconnected households also connected? There, so, I mean, there's there's a definition of a wide array of relatives, right? Like it may be, for instance, your third, your fifth cousin or some, some other people. Like some of these kinship networks are very big in the village. But to some extent, you know, being related to somebody is not necessarily uh, that different when everybody is connected in the village. Uh, I think like the other piece of evidence that may speak to this result is actually when we look at lending instead of borrowing. So when we look at lending and uh, we look at the probability of lending, it is precisely connected houses the ones that are more likely to lend relative to unconnected houses. Of course, you know, we, we have like we have very few power to test differences between this, but at least the patterns are going to be, are going to be suggestive uh, of, this, of this behavior. Um, so could you clarify, just, uh, sorry, clarify the definition of connection that you're using, the exact definition? It's connections through the uh, transaction networks. Oh, they're not relatives. No, sorry. so they're economic transactions, but what kind yeah. of economic transactions? Like informal borrowing is not an economic transaction? It, it, it is part, but this, so it's connection based on economic transactions, including uh, labor markets, Right? whether you work for some household or not, whether you hire somebody from another household, uh, sales of input and output, okay? And also the transfers across households or, or loans across households, okay? Now, these networks are going to be measured before the program was uh, was implemented, okay? So it's going to be predetermined 
with respect to the program. So here we're, we're basically thinking of networks that are fixed, the program comes in, and then you know some people happen to be connected at that time and others uh, happen not to be connected at that time. So, so they that is, are they taking are... the unconnected are the ones, I, it depends on what time frame you used to mm -hmm. ask about baseline transactions. I mean, if, if you just ask in the last three days, that's very different from the last three years. <laughs> no, no, uh, okay. But it's is it the, the case that mm -hmm. the first three years? Two years, yeah. Two years, three, yeah. The, so the, the these are people, so the, the unconnected were then borrowing, they hadn't borrowed previously from mm -hmm. their relatives. And it is only yeah. after the program that they started borrowing. Is that, that's what's happening? That, that, that is one possibility that's certainly consistent uh, with, with this coefficient. There is an increase in the probability of borrowing from relatives or unconnected households, right? That, that is something that is happening. If we look uh, at- I think the, John's point is that these people are still connected through being yes, relatives. Yes. So, well, you mean, wouldn't it make more sense to think about two types of connections, you know, the economic connections and the relative connection? Because it seems like there's a third unconnected group, right? That has neither oh, relatives right. or economic, which are not really captured here. And maybe you're yes. capturing different types of connections. It's, it's yes, no, yeah, that, 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 that is possible. I mean, I, I let it this way because it, it sort of maps nicely to, to the initial resort, but, but certainly we can, we can try to learn something about the different type of connection, right? Probably being connected through kinship is not the same than being connected through the labor market or being connected through the market of input and goods. That's certainly something that, that is possible to do, but the caveat again is, is power, right? Because uh, it's, it's a small sample of, of data. So you might be asking a lot to the data. Um, so yeah, I mean, before concluding, I think <clears throat> I, I think I have like five minutes more or? Um, no, you have more than 10 minutes. You have 13 minutes, I think. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so basically we learned first that there were some connection-based distortions in the allocation of credit. Uh, we then learned that um, the secondary markets to some extent may partially offset this, this uh, targeting frictions. Of course, at a price, uh, I would say a high price. Now, the third thing that I think is important to try to understand is uh, to which extent this eliminating this connection-based advantage can lead to increases in welfare or aggregate output, for instance, to sort of to try to understand the aggregate costs of connections. And the second important question is uh, to which extent this uh, decentralized way of allocating resources can actually be more desirable than a centralized way uh, of, of allocating resources. Okay, so those are like the three type of questions that I'm going to be after. And I'm going to be showing you some results on uh, two counterfactual allocations that I'm going to be explaining in, in detail. Uh, but the idea is that we're gonna care about three outcomes. Um, the first one, we're gonna use uh, social welfare based on consumption. By using a constant uh, relative, uh, relative risk aversion utility function. And we're gonna be uh, taking advantage of that curvature. We're also gonna be looking at inequality. And why is this important? Because we observed at the very beginning of the presentation that uh, credit was given to the wealthier households. So we're gonna try to see if whether by eliminating this connection-based advantage, uh, inequality can be declined. But also because these loans can ultimately fund uh, profitable project it would be interesting to us uh, in understanding whether uh, there is an increase in aggregate output. And what is nice is that in the first part of the paper, I, I estimated production functions and then we can use those elasticities to try to uh, say something about, about output. Okay, so let me start with the first, uh, first uh, counterfactual analysis. Um, basically what I want you to recall is that connected houses on average got uh, 2,000 uh, 2, baht more of program credit controlling for different characteristics, okay? And we're gonna call this coefficient uh, the connection-based advantage. It could be favoritism, it could be uh, information frictions. Uh, this, is, this is what is not explained by productivity, by uh, risk and other characteristics. What I'm going to do is take this number and multiply it for the amount uh, for the number of households that have connections with the local political elites or are members of the elite in each village, okay? 
I'm gonna take that number for each village, and then I'm gonna redistribute it among the people that didn't borrow from the program. Okay, so that's the exercise that we're going to try to do. And then uh, what I'm gonna to try to do is compute measures of social welfare, uh, consumption inequality, and then uh, aggregate output. Okay, so that is the the, the first exercise. And what so you can share, share. sure. How do you assess the welfare value of credit for any household? So I presume credit is, it's not a grant, it's money that has to be repaid. So it, there may be a smoothing benefit. There's a mm -hmm. benefit in terms of timing of payments, but you know, how do you, I mean, evaluating the welfare value of smoothing is, requires mm -hmm. you to model risk and all, yeah, all that, yeah. so yeah. No, no, we're not gonna go full modeling here. We're not gonna have like a full blown model uh, to, to simulate this. Uh, let me tell you a little bit what I do. You would be disappointed though, because I'm not going to totally ignore the dynamic uh, consequences of, of credit. I'm mostly going to focus on basically consumption. What I did is basically, I assumed uh, that uh, each household would allocate certain share of credit uh, to consumption. I take the causal estimates from the AJ paper from Joe Kabowski and Rob Towson that find like an increase of one to one between a program credit and consumption. Okay, and I'm gonna use that to sort of map uh, borrowing from the program to consumption. Okay, so that is. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I, I totally ignore the 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 time varying part, but as you say, it, that is extremely useful. And I think that type of modeling goes beyond my skills and beyond. Uh, beyond beyond the paper, okay? So what do we find when we do this allocation, when we allocate credit from connected uh, borrowers uh, to non-borrowers? What I find is that um, <clears throat> social welfare measure as, you know, the weighted average of these utility functions uh, uh, with, and the argument is consumption uh, improves. That's what the negative means in this type of functions. Um, uh, so then what I find is that uh, consumption inequality declines. And I just want to focus on the idea and the intuition behind this. So these connected households, the ones that were getting more money from the program, also tended to be wealthier. Okay. So basically what this reallocation exercise is doing is taking money from rich guys and giving it to uh, lower income borrowers. Okay? So I, have means... a, I have a couple of questions. I mean, sure, sure. first of all, so this is just reallocating money and assuming they consume, but doesn't capture the spillover effect that you just described where somehow this oh, no. program increases informal lending, so other help. And then the, the second, I, I assume that's true, and then but that, that could be a little bit misleading. And secondly, mm -hmm. you it might be useful to first show us how the program itself affected inequality. Uh, because okay, you mean, I mean, it, you haven't really done that. I mean, uh, and because you've just looked at, you show that. Um, the, the richer households get the loans, but then you also show there's a lot of informal lending. Mm -hmm. so you haven't really showed a, like a reduced form of the total effect on households of the program. Yeah. No, no, all I mean, loans, from all loans. I mean, or, from, or from access all loans. to all loans. I mean, there are two ways of thinking about this, right? Uh, the first one is that I would love to do it, but I came to this research project uh, six years after because Rob Towson and Joe Kabowski have a paper exactly on that. So I, that's basically where, you know, they, they show that the program uh, increased consumption. It didn't have uh, significant effects on production. Uh, okay. Uh, and that's basically the key takeaway of the program. So as a lot of other credit programs, the program was, was successful in the sense that it increased con uh, consumption, but had non-transformational uh, uh, results, quite, quite, uh, quite common or consistent with other papers in the literature, right? And the other question is that, you know, there's a lot of money coming to these villages um, and putting this, being poured into this village. And for sure, uh, there might be some positive uh, effects. I think what I really care about in this paper is trying to understand how the allocation process work and what is this dynamics uh, that, that are, seem to be interesting between the connected and unconnected household and try to quantify the role of, of, of connection. But sure, yeah, I mean, your point is well taken. I, I didn't do that. Uh, but, but I mean, some very smart people are, are did it already. So, so that's, that's, that's why I'm not showing that in this paper. Sorry, so, they, so the early work finds no effect on inequality or finds an effect on inequality? They find an effect on consumption. So that's, that's something. I, I, I didn't measure, I, 
I don't recall that they measure inequality. They find an effect on consumption, yeah, and no effects on uh, input investment and so on. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more. And sorry, uh, mm -hmm. just to understand this, uh, do you assume that the marginal effect of credit on consumption is the same for everybody? No. You no, would expect no. significant heterogeneity. Are you picking it off Kaborski Townsend? The no. Heterogeneity in that dimension? Oh, in that dimension? So I'm assuming that one, one dollar of village fund credit uh, goes translated into one dollar in consumption. So that is going to be constant across this, uh, these households. What is not going to be constant is the marginal utility of consumption because we're using a concave fund utility. Ah, okay. So, so that, that, that's why uh, the parameters of the utility function are going to be, to be important. And of course, I mean, the, the, the higher the risk aversion parameter is, uh, the, the higher the gain in terms of welfare is going to be because, uh, because of concavity, okay? But this is, uh, the change in inequality is something that doesn't require an utility function. It's simply measuring consumption under, under two scenarios. Now, the other thing I wanna uh, show is that when we reallocate the credit to, from connected uh, borrowers to, to non-borrowers, there is an increase in aggregate output. And the increase is going to depend on the assumptions that we make on how households are going to be spending these loans. If they spend the, uh, only on uh, fixed capital, okay, the, the gains are going to be very, very, very small. If they spend more on intermediate inputs, such as fertilizer and so on, uh, the effects are going to be high. Uh, this is consistent uh, uh, with, with the idea that these loans are uh, short-term loans, right? And probably this scenario is going to be and more, more realistic, but if anything, I mean, the big gain from reallocating resources and eliminating this connection-based advantage is going to come uh, from the inequality part, okay? Now, the second, the, se the question is now that whether there, are, we know that there might be some gains from eliminating this connection-based advantage, what are policy relevant ways of eliminating the connection-based advantage, okay? And one may say, well, oh, maybe if we have a clear rule that says, who deserves credit and who doesn't, that may not be subject to elite capture, that may eliminate this connection-based advantage. And the answer is maybe. Uh, so let's, let, let's try it out. And I basically gonna focus on the most common rule uh, in the allocation of credit, which is a scoring model, okay? So let me tell you a little bit uh, what I did. So I use pre-programmed data, um, uh, self-reported information on repayment. Uh, for uh, several loans before, that were reported before the program. I use that to feed a, a lasso model. And I use that, that model was having um, repayment on, as a dependent variable, demographic characteristics as regressors, uh, uh, financial history up to that point as, as regressors, and also uh, uh, variables uh, related to the balance sheet of the houses that are generally what a bank uh, has in their, in their files. Okay, so I try to. To, to mimic that process. I estimated this model, of course, for a select example of people that ever borrow. I did what a bank would do, which is apply that model to the people uh, that didn't borrow, generate a score. And based on that score, I selected the households that uh, would be eligible uh, based on repayment for this program, such that the number of, uh, of households that receive a loan is constant across the two counterfactual scenarios, okay? So what is the idea here? Is that we're gonna have some set of households that uh, for instance are, are very risky, okay? And would have not been eligible uh, by the credit scoring model, but ended up with a uh, program credit. So we're gonna take resources from them. I'm going to give resources to households that uh, didn't borrow from the program, but uh, were not risky and would have been eligible under a credit scoring model. Okay. So that is the idea, that is the spirit of the allocation. Uh, something uh, that was interesting uh, regarding this, this credit scoring model is that it actually, uh, repayment is very correlated with wealth okay? and with the number of assets that you have. So in principle, this credit scoring model targets wealthier houses. And what that means is that when I conduct the reallocation again, I'm taking money from connected houses that are wealthier and giving it to households that don't uh, have low risk, but are also very wealthy, okay? And what that leads is to uh, 
uh, a decline in welfare and an increase in inequality, precisely because those households with lower risk are the wealthiest households in this village. Okay. At the same time, this is going to lead uh, to very negligible uh, increases in aggregate output. Why? Because this might be going to some productive houses, but remember these houses are wealthier and therefore they have a lot of assets and the marginal product from delivering uh, credit to these houses might be small and hence the lower uh, estimate of improvements in aggregate uh, output. Um, so yeah, just to finalize, um, what we have learned from this paper. So first, uh, community-based approaches to target credit can suffer from connection-based allocative distortions. That's not that new. I think one of the contributions of the paper is to try to understand what this correlation between being connected with the local political elites and obtaining more money uh, means. Okay, that's I think one of the contributions. The second contribution is trying to provide some evidence, and this is more a proof of context uh, of concept of whether informal markets to some extent can reallocate resources and sort of attenuate this potential targeting distortion. And, and we find some evidence that that is the case. And the second uh, piece of evidence is that although these programs, uh, this type of approaches to allocate resources might be subject to the allocative distortions, okay, they may still be preferable to other um, centralized approaches that don't leverage on the information available to community members and to some extent they're potentially more expensive uh, uh, to, to implement. And just here are some, uh, some policy considerations. One reason why uh, I think uh, this sort of resource arise in the context of this community-based program is that the government incentives were basically at the village level, right? If the village fund does good, then there is more bon money for the village. If the village fund is not doing good, there is a punishment to the village. There is no like direct incentive for the members of the village fund committee. And I think this is quite important for the design of this type of program. Okay? One would say, well, we can rely on community members and the elections so that villagers hold them accountable. But when there is a symmetry in power, then this mechanism may not be the most effective. So probably some sort of incentives uh, to these local committees might work. The other thing is that we usually think of informal markets as evil, okay, as users as people that uh, take advantage of other households, giving them loans at higher interest rates. But to some extent, I mean, informal markets may do what markets are supposed to do at some extent, right? Which is to target resources to the people that, that may actually want them. Uh, want them. Uh, and, um, I wanna, I wanna end, end on, this, on this note, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Diego. Uh, are there more questions? Well, if I may, uh... Uh, it, seems it seems that there, that there were, were substantial uh, lack of repayment amongst poorer borrowers from your last section. Mm -hmm. So these enforcement problems, mm -hmm. that, that has two implications. Mm -hmm. It may rationalize, you know, given some sustainability objectives, mm -hmm. some lending in a way that would ensure that the loans were being repaid, which would, you know, create a, mm -hmm. some you know, some bias against the poor. Mm -hmm. And the other is that the welfare effect of the loans may actually be higher in terms of effects on consumption. If somebody doesn't repay a loan, then mm -hmm. conceivably the effect of the loan on their consumption is a lot higher. So, sure. Sure. Uh, so from that standpoint, I mean, I think your, your results about the allocation between the village council members and the non-council members seem persuasive, but I'm still not very clear in terms of, you know, mm. what you're finding about the distributional effects of mm. uh, lending to the non-council members. That seemed like about 80% or more of the credit in the program. Mm. So that that is also sort of important, mm -hmm. uh, I guess. So I'm just wondering whether, you know, you could make a case at least for justifying the kind of allocation you see amongst the non-council members Mm -hmm. you know, based either on welfare grounds uh, and or uh, the, the welfare, uh, sort of welfare come sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a very insightful point. I mean, the way I have thought about this is that, you know, uh, if you want to help the poor, then you give money to the poor. And that's not necessarily what, what we're finding. I, I haven't really thought about this, this, this idea that it's also the poor, the ones that 
that only pay. What, what is true though, when we've, um, we've seen the data is that uh, connected houses and the people that end up obtaining the loans uh, around several measures of, of credit history don't seem to be better, right? But of course, this is information that is before the program. It's not necessarily informative about future repayment from a, from, from a different loan. So yeah, that, that, that is a caveat and probably that is something I should, I should, think, uh, I should think a little bit more in order to, to, sharpen, to sharpen the narrative. Thank you. On, on a related note, um, if you think the lenders are risk averse in some way, then maybe the fact that they give large loans at lower interest rates to these connected people actually is a way to, maybe the repayment rates are actually higher and they're less risky. And so they value that and that's a trade-off. I don't know if you've considered that as an explanation for the result. I mean, yeah, that, that is possible, but but then again, we should we should observe that the, the repayment is actually higher when you give it to the connected houses, right? And and we don't find evidence that that, that that's the case. Uh, so that is something that should happen if that mechanism is actually true in the data, but 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 we don't. And the other thing is that I think repayment in this type of loans is, is super high because you really, as a borrower, you cannot mess up with the village, right? You cannot mess up with the people. Like there's, I think. There's a lot of incentive for, 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 for repayment. And, and in particularly like the government, you know, have the, its eyes focused on repayment and sustainability. But of course there are other rules that uh, can be broken by the, by, by, by the local elites or by the village uh, fund committee, right? Like there's no, nothing saying that you, you can, for instance, give a person a loan that is basically super cheap and another person a, a loan that is super, super, um, Super expensive, or nothing tells you how much you should tell to each person on on um, based based on their connections. Mm -hmm. And precisely where we find action is in the types uh, of outcomes that are subject to discretion and, and that are not targeted by their government regulations. So that's that's something again that that seems 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 to be assuring. Thank you, Leonardo. We have more questions. All right, so if not, then uh, I think we'll end here. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much, Diego, for a very interesting talk. Uh, and we will all get back together hopefully in January. So the 12th of January is when actually Erica De Serrano, who I think is here even now, uh, will be talking. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.